Good afternoon, everybody. It's um, it's time for another update. Uh, we now have uh, 68 Connecticut residents who have uh, tested positive for COVID-19. And uh, Dr. Carter, who's here, will tell you that number in terms of people infected is probably much more than that, just have not yet been tested. As you probably could tell, it it's uh, been accelerating through the state, starting maybe down in Westchester County. Fairfield County is where the bulk of the uh, incidents are, but now Litchfield County and Hartford, New Haven. Southeast Connecticut is um, thankfully uh, the last to um, have an incident there, but um, we know what's coming. I'm here with uh, our team that we've been working night and day. We've been working with uh, business community, large and small. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about them today. Obviously, meeting with our hospitals and making sure they're ready for what could come. Meeting all of our mayors and superintendents. You know, previously, we spent a lot of time talking about what we're doing in terms of education and closing the schools, telecommuting, teleeducation, ways we're taking care of um, social distancing. You know, I know you see the pictures coming over from places like Italy, and people tell you Italy is two weeks ahead of uh, the United States, two weeks ahead of Connecticut. I just want you to know that there are other places, including parts of Asia, Singapore, Hong Kong, where they took the social distancing very seriously, more seriously and earlier than they did in Italy, and they were able to mitigate um, uh, the destruction in a serious way, and we're trying to do the same thing here. Probably... In the last couple of days, the most significant change is what we've been doing with the business community. As we've been um, slowing down business activity, places where people tend to congregate, places where people could uh, exchange uh, COVID germs. As you know, I work in conjunction with the governors of uh, New Jersey and New York. Um, you know, we shut down bars tragically on the eve of St. Patrick's Day and restaurants. And that represents well over 100,000 of our citizens. And I think you're going to see the hospitality in industry um, impacted uh, in the near future, just in terms of what's going on in that market. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time today talking about what we can do for these people and these small businesses who have been so impacted by uh, the shutdown of um, you know, significant pieces, in particular, of our service economy. Kurt Westby is here, our Commissioner of Labor, and he'll tell you what we're doing in terms of um, expanding unemployment compensation. So it's not just employees, but also those hourly workers and independent contractors. We're doing everything we can to make sure they know that they will be able to have coverage and uh, can weather this storm. He told me uh, something surprising, for me anyway, uh, this morning when we talked which is uh, we usually have about 40,000 people over the last, say, average over the last couple of years on uh, unemployment uh, compensation. That has been a pretty good time. Uh, usually when a recession comes in a place like Connecticut, maybe the numbers go up to, say, 5,000 people a week applying for unemployment comp. Yesterday, 10,000 people applied to the Department of Labor for unemployment compensation. It gives you an idea of the scale of what we're trying to uh, work. We're working very closely with our federal delegation, trying to get um, the federal government to continue or at least start to take the lead here. Uh, we're getting some um, indications that they might be moving closer to a bill, hopefully uh, mirroring what came out of the House in the uh, U.S. Senate. Uh, they're talking about significant cash payments made to people so they get cash in their pocket during this uh, time. We're talking about obviously two weeks of paid sick leave. So you still got a job and you're not feeling quite right. You feel like you may have flu-like symptoms. Go home. You don't have to worry about uh, meeting that paycheck. We got a uh, paid um, sick leave and we'll be able to cover you that. And if the federal government doesn't get that right, Connecticut will get that right. I want you to be able to count on that. In addition, the federal uh, plan is talking about um, paid family leave as well so that you have an extended period of time if you have to uh, not only quarantine yourself but take time um, you know, to heal yourself. Talking about health care, uh, Deirdre Gifford, who runs Department of Social Services, is not here, has been um, 
really taking the lead on a number of things. One, making sure the testing is available, COVID testing, at no cost to anybody. That's part of the federal plan, but we're making sure it happens right here in the state of Connecticut. Medicaid, um, those without documentation, make sure that's covered in your insurance as well. Uh, we're close to uh, four or 500 tests now we did, um, you know, just yesterday. That's up from, uh, say, 20 when we started out just at our state lab. We have a long way to go, and uh, we'd be in a very different position if we were able to do more testing earlier. But I do want people to know if they have those flu-like symptoms and they contact their doctor and they get the permission, we now have, uh, what, eight, nine, ten hospitals doing uh, drive-by swabs, which are better, and more and more we can get people tested in within, uh, say, 24, 36, 48 hours. We're catching up there. Uh, Josh reminded me that the Red Cross has put out a particular appeal. A lot of people are no longer donating blood. We need your blood donations now. You don't have to worry in terms of um, you're totally segregated in terms of distance separation. No worry in terms of COVID. This is a time we need folks to step up and the Red Cross needs your help. Finally, what Deirdre is working on is uh, opening up the enrollment period. We want people to be able to maintain their health insurance. We want no excuse for you not to be able to reach out to your primary care doc, reach out to a doctor, uh, get the checkup uh, you may need. So we have open enrollment on the uh, Obamacare exchange uh, and also for Husky Vision, which is Medicaid. And it looks like we're going to get a significant um, piece of um, Uh, cash from the federal government to help us expand Medicaid, probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars as a reimbursement. That will be very helpful to make sure that nobody uh, goes without health care. Everybody will have that paid for. A couple other things we're working hard on. Beth Bai, who you know, um, early childhood. Keep your daycare centers open. I know there are a lot of municipalities that are thinking otherwise right now. We need you. They're um, health care workers, they're first responders, and uh, their families, uh, mom, dad, uh, they've got to make sure their kids are taken care of in a safe environment or else they won't be able to go to the hospital and be able to take care of uh, you or your parents. We need those people able to do that. So I urge each and every one of you, get that open. If you don't want to send your child to daycare, if you have a trusted um a friend or neighbor or family member who can take uh, care of your child, that's great. If you're telecommuting, that's wonderful. Uh, That opens up space for some of our first responders, so they'll be uh, taken care of as well. Keep your daycare open. We're also looking at housing, and I think about housing in a couple of different ways. One, our homeless uh, population, but if they have COVID-19, if they need uh, 14 days to self-quarantine or more, I want to have housing for them in a uh, quarantine area so they can't be there and able to infect anybody else and they can heal uh, themselves. So Deirdre and our uh, housing team is looking at housing right now that's going to be available for them. Um, Also, we're thinking about housing in terms of alternate or expanded settings for our hospitals. So that if we find we do have congestion there, we do have oversupply, we do need some extra capacity that we'll be able to take folks who are maybe on the mend, put them into a um, uh, a separate housing where they'll be able to heal and we open up another hospital bed for those in need. Food. We're doing better on food. You know, right now there are an awful lot of people who um, we're worried are going without. A lot of people who have just lost a paycheck, worried about what they've got to do. Food share is taking the the lead for us when it comes to uh, making sure that people are fed. First of all, I want to give a shout out again to the folks that work in our schools. They've been extraordinary. Those that work in the cafeteria, they continue to work. We're able to negotiate a waiver, and that waiver means that uh, we'll be able to continue that cafeteria service. And, uh, you know, meals are available for those who have, uh, you know, zero cost or discounted meal plans. They'll be able to continue to be uh, covered in a drive-by way, same way as we're trying to do the restaurants. Uh, In addition, when it comes to food share and others who may be in need, uh, we've reached out to the university community and they've reached out to us. And they said, because our university just closed down now, we have some excess food. They're making that available with food share. And also a number of our restaurants, you know, please make sure you know you can order out from your restaurant and continue to give them, um, you know, business on an uh, order out basis. But in the meantime, many of them are also making food available. 
And I got to tell you, I'm so proud of the people of Connecticut, what they're doing standing up and uh, through voluntary help and they're raising their hand and doing what more they can. Stop and shop. I'm sort of um, impressed reading just uh, today, I think, that, um, you know, older residents, those over the sixth age of 60, I know that age group, they're going to be able to get to a stop and shop earlier, starting uh, later this week. So they'll be able to shop and not be in fear of being infected by any of the younger people as some of our um, uh, grocery stores get increasingly crowded. Renee Coleman Mitchell is helping take the lead as we continue to coordinate with our hospitals as we try and flatten the curve and think about what we can do if we have uh, increased demand and we will have increased demand there. Working very closely with the Fed, seeing what we can do to access more protective equipment. I want to salute those hospitals that have stepped back from doing elective surgery. Uh, I know a lot of this is scheduled and a lot of this is uh, ready to go and some of it is a uh, priority. But every time there's an elective surgery, which we don't have to do now that can be put off, that's another bed, that's another um, protective gown that's available to a doctor to take care of uh, somebody who may have COVID-19. So I thank the hospitals that have stepped up and I hope we continue to do that. We're also working with the Department of Public Health and Renee in terms of uh, certification, seeing what we can do to get more nurses available now. We have a number of trainee nurses. We're accelerating um, their certification. We're also reaching out to retired nurses, those that are retired. We need you. And we're going to need you over the next two, three, five, six weeks. So please uh, reach out to the, um, your former hospital where you were. We need you to be able to step back. I continue to talk every day with my uh, fellow governors on the phone um, just a little bit ago with Andrew Cuomo. Uh, we'll be thinking in terms of other steps uh, going forward in terms of the primary, in terms of malls. Uh, nothing to announce on that, but what we're trying to do, we're trying to work on a coordinated basis, on a regional basis, which makes the most sense. If the Fed is slow to step in, we're on a regional basis. The governors are going to take the lead. You know, with that, I've got who else do we have here? Kurt's going to be able to talk a little bit if you have questions about what we're doing, you know, for those folks who, uh, you know, need um, unemployment compensation and how we're able to expand that. Melissa is here, who's been taking the lead at OPM and working on our legislative um, uh, package. And uh, look, we can't count on the feds. We're going to have to step forward, be able to fill that gap, especially on a timely basis. Melissa has been helping to take the lead on that. Dr. Carter is here. Our chief epidemiologist will be able to tell you a little bit about the flow and what's going on in terms of this um, pandemic that's going on. But I'd really like to uh, introduce to you now David Lehman. You know him from uh, economic and community development. Look, I come out of small business and uh, I know what's going on with small business and folks are terrified. You know, you've got a lot of uh, employees who count on you every day to keep their families uh, with a salary. Uh, you've, you're paying electric bills, you're paying a rent, you're paying debt, you're paying health insurance. You have these fixed costs and all of a sudden uh, your revenues disappear. And uh, David has been helping to take the lead, working closely with our small business to make sure they're in the best position to power through this with support from the state. Make sure those families know that on the backside of this, they're still going to have a job in a small business. David. Governor, thank you. Um, so wanted to really spend some time talking about what steps we've been taking in the Lamont administration to help both small businesses and their employees. And we realize right now that businesses are taking significant hits, that uh, there's been really an unprecedented demand shock, uh, whether it started last week or, or, or shortly before that, uh, with the COVID virus. So we're very sensitive to that and we want to make sure we're addressing it very quickly and urgently. I think there are lots of tools in the, in the toolbox here, so I wanted to touch on a few of them and then there's going to be more to come in the future. Uh, first and foremost, as the governor mentioned, Commissioner Westby's here, and really under Commissioner Westby's leadership at DOL, we've really taken the lead in relaxing certain requirements for individuals to qualify for unemployment benefits. Uh, so, for example, uh, previously, uh, someone to, to qualify needed to be looking for work for a certain period of time, and right now, they, employees can be temporarily furloughed and still qualify for unemployment benefits. In addition, CTDOL has a work share program where employee hours can be reduced by 10 to 60 percent, where unemployment benefits can be used to supplement uh, the income for the reduced workload of that employer. 
This is a, a very significant program and really the, the first order net that we have in the state of Connecticut to make sure that people that are furloughed or are laid off, they are, they are receiving benefits very quickly. And Commissioner Westby can talk more about those programs and the significant volume that we've been seeing at CTDOL. Secondly, yesterday we were, uh, Connecticut as a state was uh, eligible for SBA disaster assistance loans. These are federal loans up to $2 million at rates between two and three quarters and three and three quarters percent with terms up to 30 years. We are one of the first states to become eligible for these loans, uh, and you can apply online at sba.gov. In addition, at DECD, we've set up a business emergency response unit for COVID-19 in particular. There is a hotline and we have repositioned our team to help businesses that are looking to access those loans or have any other questions. In addition, we're in the process of DECD with CBIA, Advanced CT, and others on a full state small business survey so we can very uh, importantly understand the specific needs of all of our businesses across different sectors. Thirdly, there's a real effort on payment relief and forbearance. On Friday, we started by announcing for the state Small Business Express portfolio, which is over 110 million, 800 odd borrowers, uh, a three month payment holiday. What was an April payment is now a July payment. So folks can worry about their payroll, their health, their family, and not worry about their payment under that, uh, under that program. Uh, we are following suit with our other programs as well. So if you have uh, funds from the state of Connecticut and you're experiencing financial hardship, you should be talking to DECD or your lender. Uh, today, also, Commissioner Perez of the Department of Banking put out uh, guidance to Connecticut state <laughs> banks, and this has come from the federal, uh, the Fed as well, uh, for federally regulated banks to be to work with your clients in these very extraordinary times to make sure that that banks are making prudent decisions, recognizing the sharp fall off in revenue that many of these businesses has have, have had. In addition, on the small business lending front, uh, Connecticut Innovations has started a program where they are offering working capital loans to all of the companies in their portfolio for short-term working capital to help them get through this. In addition, Chesla, the state student loan lender, which has 11,000 different uh, borrowers, has a financial hardship forbearance program, which uh, is two months initially, but up to six months. So if you have a student loan from Chesla, you should be exploring that financial hardship, that deferral of payments in this very unsettled time. Uh, lastly, I would say this is um, the forbearance is, is something that we continue to work on. Are there more ways we can explore this and provide this relief, in particular to small and mid-sized businesses? Uh, and I would encourage all small to mid-sized businesses to work with your lenders, to work with your suppliers, to work with your landlords. We understand this is an issue that's happening across the state and up and down, not just small businesses. But I think it's really important to engage in that dialogue uh, and, and see what payments could be delayed given the extraordinary shortfall in revenue. Fourth, I want to talk a bit about tax relief. Uh, on Sunday, I believe, uh, we, we announced that uh, business payments or the filing for businesses under both the pastor entity tax as well as the corporation tax would be delayed. Uh, so the, a delayment in filing for, I believe, 30 days, but the payment, importantly, for up to three months. So providing effectively a loan for some of these businesses and not having to worry about the, the logistics of a filing in the short term. Some of these payments were due as, as quickly as March 15th yesterday or two days ago. So I think these, um, that type of flexibility, I think is gonna be really important to business and helpful to business. In addition, today we heard from the federal government that they were extending the payment for certain individual income taxes for up to three months. So we're gonna consider that and, and really try to make sure that we're marrying what the state of Connecticut does with what the uh, federal government does where at all possible. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about utility costs. Uh, two things there. You know, there, there has been a moratorium with the help of Attorney General Tong uh, for any terminations for water, sewer, uh, electricity, as well as gas to make sure businesses and individuals don't need to worry about their utilities being shut off in a time like this. There was also um, a, a petition put forth today uh, to further reduce expenses by deep to Pura to further uh, eliminate some of the potentially the late fees and other costs that individuals could be facing if they're late on some of the utility bills. So stay tuned for more on that. Uh, in closing, I want to make two other comments. Uh, as the governor mentioned, Secretary McCaw and myself are in close coordination with, with our federal delegation. Uh, the, the federal package from D.C. has been changing since Friday. We saw what the House passed. There was a lot of information today that uh, that could be expanded and expanded significantly, uh, potentially with direct payments to individuals of $1,000. Uh, so we're very closely following that stimulus. I think it is really important that we get cash into the hands of whether it's Connecticut individuals, employees, or, or businesses very, very shortly, 
given the economic uh, situation here. So we're, we're following that in real time, staying very close to D.C., but at the same time, as the governor mentioned, we're, we're not waiting for D.C. Secretary McCaw and myself with Chief of Staff Mounds have uh, been in dialogue with legislative leadership about what the state of Connecticut can be doing and should be doing on the relief front. So we're going to be doing that concurrently while paying attention to D.C., making sure that we're taking legislative action and providing help to the citizens and small businesses of Connecticut. So with that, I'm going to stop, and we're all happy to take any questions. Governor, when announced that they will be staying open seven days a week, do you believe that malls should be closing? I believe that whatever we're going to do, we're going to do in association with our uh, fellow governors. But right now, it does seem to me that a lot of malls uh, have big areas where, uh, where folks can congregate, and they could be at some risk there. So it's something we're going to take a look at. Governor, when, when will you be making the decision on the, the April 15th tax deadline, which frankly affects everybody? Uh, if it goes to July 15th, that would be throwing the money into the next fiscal year. Is that is that a problem? Is that an issue? Is that part of your consideration here? Uh, Somebody's coming to help me. We're good. We are we are following um, the federal guidelines. We don't expect our personal tax withholding to be impacted. That's the amount that comes out of our paychecks on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, so it's only the those that do not have um, income withheld from their paychecks. That's a much smaller impact to the state of Connecticut for that extension. Uh, so as of right now, the area we're really focused on is the personal income tax withholding, and that um, in terms of filing and payment of those taxes will not be impacted. Governor, do you plan on signing any sort of executive order that would allow uh, the private labs who are doing these tests to report the negative results that they get? They can only report the positive results. I'm going to In terms of disease reporting from laboratories, um, we already get electronic laboratory reporting from all of these laboratories. Uh, we collect information on people who are sick and who test positive for diseases. This is true for all diseases, not just COVID-19. Um, we could do that for labs that report to us electronically. Uh, and. Uh, that would provide us with some useful information. But it's important to remember that uh, testing is, is important, but it's not what's going to get us through this. It's just one of the tools that we have. And it's our individual actions that are going to make a difference here. The vast majority of people who get this illness will not get very sick. Uh, they might think they have a mild cold, um, little uh, uh, feel a little achy not quite normal and be better in a few days they don't need to be tested the test also isn't useful for people who are not sick uh, it's not a screening test to see if you might have it um, right now we're using the test to uh, keep our acute care hospitals open the purpose for these testing sites that we've set up we have picked acute care hospitals to do this because um, it was necessary to set these alternate spaces or sites up where samples could be taken that's not in the emergency department because our EDs were being overwhelmed with people. Uh, and so this was really to have a place so people don't have to go to the emergency department to be tested. And most of us will not need to be tested. It's Right now, testing capacity is increasing every single day. The major thing that's uh, actually holding it back is the fact that uh, getting samples, samples taken is still a challenge because you need personal protective equipment and uh, personal protective equipment that they do not have in doctor's offices. So one of the things that we look at when we, uh, for example, we do have negative test results from the state laboratory, that the most important thing is not the number of tests, but the percentage of tests that are positive. That's the key. And um, for example, we've done, um, just give you the exact number from the state laboratory, 240 tests, 248 tests so far, 222 of them have been negative, uh, just 26 positive. Well, that's still a very low percentage. It won't be long before we start seeing 40 to 50 percent of those tests being positive. That's what we're looking for. Uh, increase in positivity rate. This happens every year. We do this with influenza as well. 
I know you may be getting different messages when you turn on the TV at night, um, because uh, I think what was it the head of WHO said the answer to this is testing, testing, testing. Uh, testing is important, but it's not the answer. And we need to use all the tools that we have to use testing to identify um, where we need to take public health actions uh, at hospitals and others to, to slow the spread of this disease down. Uh, right now, not far away from us in Greenwich, Connecticut, in Greenwich Hospital, they're working 24-7. They're not, the doctors and nurses and others haven't been sleeping for days. They're totally full. Same thing in Danbury and in Bridgeport Hospital. We now have cases in Hartford and New Haven. Um, and really, this is just starting to move across. We're just at the beginning of this. We continue to support all the testing needs of our acute care hospitals. Uh, Yale New Haven Hospital is now online with testing, and we expect to have other testing sources available for our other acute care hospitals as well. They need these test results in order to be able to manage patients and stay open. So I, I really, there are two other numbers that are much more important than the number of tests that are done. One, the number of people who've been hospitalized with COVID-19, and the second is the number of people who have died from COVID-19. Those will be the things that drive decision-making in Connecticut, and testing will support those things, but those are the two most important. Do we know how many people are hospitalized right now? It's probably at least 26, but now, um, uh, but that number is gonna grow larger. And I'd also like to point out that for every, this happens every year with influenza. And I know some people a week ago uh, heard me say that 10 to 20% of our population gets sick from influenza every year. And I did get some emails questioning my ability to do math afterwards. But it's true, we do. We don't test everybody. But we know that for every person who tests positive for flu, there's probably 100 others out there who've been sick with the flu who never get tested. And Right now, if we have 68 positives, you should assume that there's at least 100 people out there who have COVID-19 for every single positive, which puts us around 6,000 or so, and that might be a low estimate. Doctor, specifically on Eastern Connecticut, the governor said a second ago we had very, very few cases well, there. And this is, is yeah. Is, is, is the real reason that there hasn't been much testing going on there? No. Or what is the real reason? The real that? reason is, is there hasn't been people who are sick and diagnosed with uh, with symptoms of COVID-19 in hospitals in the eastern half of the state. Because we, we've been testing every single person admitted to a hospital, whether it's in the western part of the state or the eastern part of the state, who have the symptoms of COVID-19. We are getting samples submitted from the eastern part of the state, and they have all been negative. I mean, all of us are experiencing something that most, you know, most of the, none, none of us have ever experienced before. I mean, last week, I think on Thursday, there were six confirmed cases. Now there are 68. Many more people have COVID-19 than just the 68. This is the tip of the iceberg. And um, we don't have a good measure of below because there are many more people who have mild symptoms. But the people that we are focused on right now are the people who are most seriously ill and require hospitalization. That we can measure, and we'll make estimates for how big that iceberg is as we move along. Do we know how many hospital beds we have right now and how many we will need when this thing peaks? Somebody else want to ask you a question? We, we know we have about 9,000 hospital beds in the state. Um, the modeling around how many we think we need, we know the, the hospital association is working on that, um, and we're supporting that. But really, we're taking actions now, and the ho our hospital network is taking actions now to look at every opportunity, as the governor mentioned before, to postpone surgeries that can be postponed, conserve PPE. That's really the most important thing right now. Conserve PPE, conserve rooms, conserve staff to prepare for that, and look at all the other options the governor mentioned as well in terms of alternate sites for step-down capacity for people who are uh, diagnosed who have to be hospitalized but then need to go somewhere to recover that, that maybe they can't, they don't have a home or they don't have somewhere to go to. So we're looking at all of these contingency plans really focused on planning for, uh, for a significant need in the coming weeks. Any question on when it will peak? New York was saying 45 days. 
the only thing we have to draw on is that there have been, on average, three influenza pandemics every century. Um, and influenza pandemics usually come in waves. There's this, for example, in 1918, there was a spring wave, a fall wave, and another spring wave. Um, in 2009, uh, the H1N1 influenza pandemic we all experienced. Uh, it started in April and May and June and disappeared over the summer and came back in October, November, December. So the, for influenza, it's usually six to eight weeks. None of us have experienced a coronavirus pandemic before. So we really don't know. We're trying to draw on the influenza experience, but to be honest, um, we don't know if this is gonna act just like influenza or not. Is there any discussion about rent or mortgage relief? So, uh, yes, it is something that we're considering uh, and discussing how to enact that uh, and what is the best way to do that. So that, stay tuned on that. Governor, are you, are you considering uh, uh, more drastic measures? Uh, it may be premature, but I'll ask anyway. A San Francisco type things. New York City has been talking about shelter in place. Uh, obviously, there have been more drastic measures than what Connecticut has done so far. Where, where are we on that? Yeah, and what would it look like? I, I think the answer to that is not yet. I'll tell you why. I mean, we've been working with our mayors. We've been working with our superintendents. We asked, it's probably uh, appropriate to not have a St. Patrick's Day parade. They stepped up. We talked to our superintendents of schools, said I think uh, closing the schools makes sense. Uh, they stepped up. We had to uh, work hard with our uh, restaurants and um and the such, um, and, and they stepped up in, in the bars and uh, did what we have to do. And um, so I think the people of Connecticut understand the scope of what we're co confronting, and on a voluntary basis, they're stepping up and doing the right thing. Uh, you know, I've got to um, urge yet again before closing, everybody over the age of 60, everybody over the age of 70, stay in your home. You are most vulnerable. I'm staying right here as much as they, uh, I humanly can. And to young people, um, when you talk about what could be happening, I know sometimes we feel like we're, um, you know, can't be stopped, but um, it's really important for you to stay close to home. For you to, that's why we had to close down the bars. That's why I had to close down the restaurants. They were busy as early as a Saturday and Sunday night. And, uh, but I think what you're seeing right now, Chris, is people stepping up and doing the right thing. And I gotta urge you, it's serious and you can make an enormous difference if you follow that maxim. Mr. Governor, have you spoken to Governor Cuomo about his call for the Army Corps of Engineers to build a lot more hospital space? He's calling on the federal government to do that, and the federal government so far hasn't uh, responded with us. Uh, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, our team is looking at facilities when it comes to university um, dorms, when it comes to um, hotel space. We think we've got enough capacity, but we are thinking a little bit about some of the um, outside MASH type units were easier drive by in clinics. So, but at this point, I don't think there's a real need. All right. Ventilators. We're working with the hospitals every day to do everything we can to source every uh, ventilator we can. Obviously, we need more, and we're going to do everything we can to get more. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.